Hello and welcome. We're in Ballycarry in County Antrim today to meet a man with a burning enthusiasm for restoring old military vehicles. And we're going to hear the fantastic story of how Derek Beatty transformed a First World War howitzer into, well, join me and see what a great job he made. Derek, thanks very much for having us in your, your restoration workshop here today. <laughs> you're uh, welcome. This is a fantastic piece of military kit and uh, you're going to tell us the story effectively of, of this uh, article itself. But, but generally for the uninitiated, what is a howitzer? What is a howitzer? Well, a howitzer is an article, a piece of artillery that can fire indirect or direct for that matter. Um, this particular um, item was developed after the Boer War because Britain decided they didn't have anything of the equivalent of the German Krupp 12 centimetre that could fire indirect. In other words, fire over the top of a hill. So therefore right. they developed this whole sighting instrument here mm -hmm. that can be adjusted either way, up or down, or side to side. This was a complete development, this particular item here, that this is the carrier for the sight. After the Boer War, the British decided we need something to the equivalent of this Krupp. And at one stage they decided they were going to buy from Germany this particular gun. Mm -hmm. But they formed a committee back in 1906 and they put out instructions for different firms to see if they could produce such an item. And they decided in 1910 to go with their own production. And one of the main firms who produced them, as you can see here, COW, the Coventry Ordnance Works. They produced the majority of them. Mm -hmm. By 1910, it went into production. And by 1914, at the start of the First World War, they went to war with 192 of these. Before the World War ended, there was 3,359 made for that, and that's when wow. production ceased. Wow. And were they all made in the same factory then? No, right? no. They, some of them were made by Bethel Steelworks, Vickers, mm -hmm. and uh, the Royal Arsenal made some as well. But uh, the Coventry Ordnance Works was the main producer. Mm -hmm. And by 1917, they came up with the Mark II, which was the last developed design for this particular mm -hmm. howitzer. And that's the story of howitzers generally. What can you tell us about this particular one? Uh, this particular one um, belonged to the Defence Forces. After the First World War, um, the Defence Forces, which was a fledgling, um, as you would well know, uh, military force. They, this was Irish Free State. That's the that Irish time, Free yeah. State, yes. They bought four of them in 1925. And between the wars, they ended up with... There's controversy with reading, some say 43, some say 48, they purchased from the British Army. Yeah. During the interwar period, they changed the wheels <clears throat> to uh, pneumaticise, in other words, rubber tyres and tubes, yeah. so that they could be pulled behind lorries as opposed to horses. They developed a braking system for them, but when I got this particular item, it was lay outside as a gate guardian, in very, very poor condition, but there was the, the, the bit there that was retrievable. So I myself went to England, we got the wheels made, I got the new braking system made, everything exactly as it would have been in the First World War. Mm. So that's basically the story of this one. Well, how important is authenticity then when you're about the restoration oh, or something like this? When you're talking to any of the military guys that restore even Second World War, everything has to be, you know, there's a, there's a, a sickness, I think. Uh, as, as, <laughs> I think they've come to the conclusion, yes, there is a problem with men who restore. It doesn't matter whether it's military <laughs> vehicles, uh, there is a problem there. But we all suffer from it. It just has to be exact. It has to be right or not at all. Yeah, and, and is it difficult then to get, I mean, you talked about the wheels, which you, ah. you got, was that difficult to, to source how that was going to happen? No, was going to do there's it? a firm down in Kent, down in the south of England, who's till to this day 
produce all the military spoke wheels, wooden wheels for all, all the king's troop, all these wheels are made down there. Expensive, but mm. to get it back to the original, that's the main thing. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, it really is. And, and other items here, this leather and yes, all those, of these. That's, that's, these the all... that's the bag that holds the sight. Yes. The clinometer is held in that bag, which goes on here to get the elevations, to get the, mm -hmm. the proper elevations to set the gun. And the recoil of the gun goes right back. This gun yeah. can fire at an astute angle, mm -hmm. which is called indirect fire. It's a, called a light artillery piece because it could be pulled by horses. Six horses would have pulled this along with the limber, the ammunition limber. Uh -huh. And did you have to get uh, this sort of material newly no, made? Most, or? No, no. Internet's a wonderful thing. <laughs> eBay, a lot of that stuff, all dated. It's all dated. Mm. For the, if you see, yeah. 4.5 inch howitzer and the date will be on it. Um, you, it, it. It's time consuming. You just have to keep watching and asking. But we got there eventually. And but how, long, how long did it take? Roughly a year from start to finish. Uh -huh. um, we had to go to England to collect the wheels because we couldn't chance getting them transported because they were very expensive to be made. So we had to go for them in a van to bring them back. Um, it pleased me at the very end that it turned out so well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and it's a fully working, it's a fully working piece, yeah. Have you had it fired? Not really, because uh, you can't get ammunition for it. You know, it's only a display piece. Yeah. But um, pleased the way it turned out. It's certainly fantastic. It's really well restored. Um, it's obviously not the easiest thing to move around, I would expect. <laughs> no, it just weighs <laughs> under a tonne and a half. And it's, uh, uh, it takes two or three men to man handle it. And all the weights on the axle, um, easily enough to tra traverse by the use of this handle. That handle folds back, and one man, it was crewed by six men, and um, you had a loader, the sighter, the gunner, the, 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 the traverse. Six men had their own job, mm -hmm. and that's the way it worked. And their horses then as well? Oh, uh, the horses. Yeah. Um, each battery would have had six of these in a battery. Uh, you'd A, B and C battery. D mm -hmm. battery was the 4.5 howitzers. The, the other four, or the other three, sorry, they would hit the 13 pounder and the 18 pounder. Basically they fired direct at the enemy, whereas mm -hmm. the howitzer was indirect, fired over the hill. You had yeah. spotters and whatnot out, you know, letting you know, letting the gunners know, mm -hmm. telephoning back and radioing back and signalling back. You're too far. Reduce your distance and whatnot, yeah. and that's how the indirect. It was a, it was a new development really in the in the First World War. Quite innovative then, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you got to see something of how it worked because you were involved in a reenactment. Oh yes. Oh. So you saw how how it all operated. All operated. Not absolutely. with this piece, but no. We were over uh, uh, the hundredth anniversary of the the Third Battle of Ypres, called the ba Battle of Passchendaele. Uh, one of the most horrendous battles in the First World War. The rain started around about July and never stopped for three full months. There was more people killed than that than uh, I think any other real battle except for the Battle of the Somme. Um, we were invited over um, to fire a 100 gun salute and uh, we were asked by the organiser, a man called John Sly, who would be one of the main restorers of First World War artillery, he invited us over to man an 18 pounder gun and there was 16 guns all together and each one fired approximately seven shots and we were manning number 11 gun on the 11th mm -hmm. hour at the 11th month <laughs> <laughs> and John Slough didn't even realise that yeah. until I pointed it out to him that we were uh, there but they were from all different parts. Uh, the 16th Irish was represented as well at that particular, but it was um, it was very nostalgic. Yeah, really so it was glad. An amazing experience. Amazing experience. Yep. Yeah. And in the actuality of it, the noise must have been horrendous oh, uh, back in the first world war. World war. I, I don't know how the young fellows. You know, the average age was from nineteen to twenty-two, and you know, in the, in the trenches, they did not know whether they were going to be alive yeah. at the end of the day or not. In some of the battles, horrendous. Yeah, yeah. horrendous. Well, the, I suppose the icing on the cake, to use that term, in terms of this item, is that you managed to 
have an added piece now as well. Oh yeah. Which you've restored with an old right. ammunition yes. wagon form we, as well. We, we were able to pick that up. That uh, too belonged to the Defence Forces, but that ended up in England again down in Kent. And I knew I actually knew about that before I knew about the gun. And uh, the chap would never think of selling it mm. until I got a phone call one day at work to say, are you still interested in the ammunition wagon? This was years later, after I had restored this. Yeah. I near fell off my feet, because <laughs> <laughs> that goes along with the gun. That's, that's an ammunition wagon, as opposed to an ammunition limber. Mm -hmm. That carried twice the amount of shells. That carried 32 rounds, whereas the limber carried 16, and all the equipment would have been strapped to the top of it. So that was a rust bucket as well. <laughs> Uh, again, it took me, uh, I think it took me longer to restore that because it was a lot of metal work, whereas this is very, very heavy work, you know, it's just, yeah. there's a lot of metal work had to be repaired in that. Again, new wheels all had to be added. Um, the same firm again made the, the wheels for me. Again, we had to go for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic as well. Mm. It looks really, really well. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe this is a speculative question, but how many pairs of these exist together in, in well, the present time? Well, that's think? an interesting question. I'll tell you why. Whenever I went to restore the ammunition limber, I contacted nearly every museum in England, military museum in England, and not one of them had an ammunition limber because I needed a, a copy of the braking system to see how it operated because, again, this particular wagon had been um, transformed uh, using the wooden wheels as opposed to the rubber pneumatized mm -hmm. wheels. So therefore the braking system was different. Wrote to, I think about six museums, all were sympathetic, but none of them had an ammunition wagon and they were amazed that this had still survived uh -huh. and it was in Northern Ireland. Um, so therefore I reverted back to the gun and with photographs that I had in the actual manual for the 4.5 inch gun, I copied the braking system and altered it to suit the ammunition wagon. But it's as close to the drawings that I have that you would ever get. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So there aren't too many of them that are No, together. Appar apparently not. Um, they don't even have one in the Defence Forces down south. Uh, they have a few of the 4.5 inch guns, but they're usually all as gate guardian. They don't even have one in their museum. They don't have a 4.5 in their museum down in Nakora. The um, they have a good collection, I might add, mm -hmm. uh, down in Nakora with artillery. But funny enough, not a 4.5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long have you been rescuing old vehicles like this? Oh. My wife says too long. <laughs> um, people say, how did your marriage last so long? And my wife said he was either in work and when he came home from work and had his tea, he was out in the shed restoring vehicles. David, I have been restoring vehicles, I think, all my married life. But it was mainly Second World War. But this came along and this took over. Is it, it must be quite unusual to find a First World War one. To Absolutely. Be able to Absolutely. Um, there's very few 4.5 inch guns, even in restored condition. There's a few, mm -hmm. um, but you can really count in both hands the number that would be in private hands. Very, very few in private. There's a few in museums in Australia. Russia, believe it or not, uh, bought quite a few off Britain between the wars, and they used them. Right, yeah. uh, Britain lost quite a few of theirs at the expeditionary force when they had to leave Dunkirk. They had to leave a lot of these behind, so there was quite a few lost. There we go. Well, Derek, thank you. We're very privileged that you've let okay. us see both Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>